this reading from a radio interview on CBC's The Current earlier this year with David Miller. He's a former mayor of Toronto and a former chair of C40 Cities. That's a network of mega cities committed to addressing climate change. And just before I start this, I just want to say that this service on cities is very meaningful to me as a city employee. I've worked in the city of Edmonton for nine years now. But even in my early years as a reporter, I covered City Hall. So city politics and city government has always been of interest to me. So these are the words of David Miller in this interview, a transcript from what he said about cities. Cities are not only the place where we can address climate change. They're also the places that are having a serious impact because of climate change. The increasing frequency and severity of storms really impact our cities. Our infrastructure, the people who live there, insurance claims, it's incredibly costly and challenging. So why you're seeing mayors from around the world leading on this issue is, first of all, mayors hear from their constituents who want to see environmental leadership. There's an imperative to address these questions because the alternative is very difficult for cities. If we don't address these issues, we're literally going to have to rebuild our cities. Think about New York City and the impact of Hurricane Sandy some years ago and the potential of sea level rise literally flooding Wall Street, you know, the financial heart of the world. These are really serious issues. And mayors are motivated to act because they can't wait to see what national governments are going to do. National governments seem to talk, mayors act. Then he goes on to cite a C40 engineering report. About 70 or 75% of greenhouse gas emissions in the world could be attributed to activities in cities or in activities to support them, like generating power. Those emissions predominantly come from three things, how we heat and cool our buildings, how we transport ourselves, and how we generate electricity. And all of those are areas where you can significantly lower greenhouse gases by building more efficient new buildings, things like the LEED standard, doing energy refits of old buildings, electrifying transportation, building more mass transit, and greening our electricity grid. And at the same time, all of those things make better places to live if you have better mass transit, you have less congestion, and cleaner air. So what you see are actions that mayors would like to do anyway to make their cities better, also having a really positive impact on lowering greenhouse gases. If we get our buildings right, our transport right, and our electricity right, we can make dramatic reductions and have more prosperous places for people to live. He goes on to say that the job of being a mayor is an activist one. People expect you to produce results. They don't expect you just to say the right thing. They expect to see things really happen, whether it's building mass transit or changing the electricity grid. They have that expectation. So mayors are impatient and action-oriented. Then he concludes, I do see the rise of cities. We see the C40 being far more influential on this issue and issues like inequality. And I think as you see national boundaries becoming less and less relevant, because of globalization and trade agreements, you're going to see cities become more and more relevant. They are already taking a place on the international stage. Citizens who live in cities look first to the city for services. The services they deliver touch people in in every way, from health to transportation to libraries. I see cities rising. The words of David Miller. I want to first thank John for doing a wonderful job service leading as usual. He always adds to the service. Well, on October 16th, a week from Tuesday, we have the right and the responsibility to go to polls to elect a mayor, city council, and school boards. Now, historically, these are the lowest turnout elections of all the three levels of government that we get to choose. And in years like this, when there are few real battles, especially at the mayoral level, the turnout goes even worse, sometimes as low as 25% or even less. The vast majority seem to think that that if any elections matter, it's the federal and the provincial ones. And civic elections are kind of like sideshows, sort of the junior high school of the political order. 
And I want to suggest that this is getting it backwards. Democracy is fundamentally about the way people make decisions together for the greatest good. As our children's version of the Unitarian Universalist principle puts it, everyone should have a say in the things that matter to them. So casting one vote of the 17.5 million votes cast in the last federal election is really not having much of a say. Perhaps we should be looking at key decisions being made at more manageable levels than in nation states. The noted Unitarian theologian James Luther Adams wrote about this value of voluntary associations back in the 1960s and 70s. Forming his views, he drew on his passion for our liberal church approach. Says his biographer Van Eric Fox, Adams's conception of meaning and importance of voluntary associations grew directly from his understanding of authentically free spirit in the free church. He described the free church as a body of believers joined in a covenant of loyalty to the Holy Spirit of love, intentionally inclusive of dissent, governed by its own members and fiercely independent from government control. He interpreted participation in voluntary associations, whatever the character of government, as the chief means by which beneficial social change has been effected throughout history and is the key to the meaning of human history. Now remember, he was writing in the late 1960s in the United States during the era when black churches were spearheading the civil rights movement and when all churches were adding powerful voices against the Vietnam War. His main point was that grassroots democracy was where real change could take place, small group to small group. Edmonton, with its long-standing tradition of community leagues, has a positive history where these local voluntary associations have a strong voice in the development uh, issues in their neighborhoods, in setting speed limits and speed bumps, park and leisure program development, and a whole raft of other issues. Council listens to the community leagues. It is fundamental democracy. Now, increasingly, we are seeing a shift of meaningful political activity down to the municipal level because this is where change takes place. This is where things get done. It's not exactly Adams' vision, but it is closer than the federal, provincial, municipal hierarchy we are used to seeing. That model is a product of ancient times in Canadian history, if you will. 150 years ago, when the British North America Act became law, recognizing Canada as an independent country, fewer than 10% of the entire population lived in the 10 largest cities. And cities might have been an exaggeration. Ottawa, the seat of the new government, had only 26,000 people in 1867, and the three smallest cities would only be classed as townships today. In contrast to that 10% of dazzling urbanites, fully one-third of enumerated workers labored in fields and fisheries. And of course, they would have their families and their children with them. The vast majority of people lived in rural settings. And the point is that the needs of cities didn't matter all that much in the grand political scheme of things when the Canadian political system was being developed. Our country was not set up either to serve the needs of municipalities or to recognize any power they might have. So given our federal, provincial, municipal pyramid of power, it's easy to forget that it wasn't always like that. In ancient days, there were city-states that dominated the political sphere. Parag Khan, a University of Singapore academic and the author of Connectug connectography, mapping the future of global civilization, reminds us that in the time before nation statements, states, virtually all power rested with the cities. It is an ancient phenomenon, he says. The cities of ancient Mesopotamia had trade agreements and decided on religion and currency, etc. This goes back 4,000 years. 
Think about it. We do not speak about ancient Greece, which actually didn't exist back then, as much as we speak of Athens or Sparta. And in the Western world, well, we were dramatically formed and shaped by the city of Rome and the empire that emanated from that city. Do you know in Rome, you had to be a citizen of the city of Rome in order to have any kind of a vote or say in government politics. And this, was, and this ruled all of Europe. You had to live in one city. The beginning of the rise of nation states as we now know them is debated by historians, but the earliest anybody puts it is about the middle of the 15th century during the Renaissance, though a more popular date is 1650 with the Treaty of Westphalia, which I will gloriously not describe. Now, the only important point to take from this historical side trip is that the idea of the federal government holding most of the critical powers is a modern concept. For most of human history, reaching back several thousand years, cities, often built around great castles, were the major organizing focus of populations. They provided protection, avenues for commerce, a locus for services, and behind high walls, security from bands of marauders. David Miller, in our reading, argues that we're now experiencing a second rise of municipal power. Even our own Prime Minister Justin Trudeau acknowledged that this June at the 12th Metropolitan World Congress, which was held in Montreal. He noted that unlike 1867, today 80% of Canadians live in cities. He also acknowledged that existing federal system does not recognize that reality. He said, cities and large cities are delivering 60% of services with only 10% of tax revenues. Now think about that. Cities deliver 60% of the public services we use to make our daily lives better. Infrastructure, food delivery, medical services, education, housing and social housing, power, transportation, first responders, arts and culture. All of those come in some way through the municipal system. Now, sure, some of them are co-funded and co-managed by other levels of government, but the services could not be delivered without city involvement. There was an interesting example of the cities flexing their collective global muscles just at this time of the World Congress in June. You see, the Congress opened two weeks after the U.S. president's bold announcement that he was pulling America out of the Paris Climate Accord. He said, I was elected to represent Pittsburgh, not Paris. But the Pittsburgh mayor, Bel Pedulto, Peduto, tweeted back almost instantly. Fact, Hillary Clinton, Clinton received 80% of the vote in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh stands with the world and will follow the Paris Agreement. And that was followed by the Paris mayor, Anne Hidalgo, tweeting, Paris and Pittsburgh do stand together for the Paris Agreement. And within days, two hundred U.S. mayors had stood up with Mr. Peduto and protested the president's decision. The pushback was furious and powerful. And you saw the same thing with immigration policy, where city after city refused to give up their illegal immigrants. Now, as much as I enjoy seeing the U.S. president getting hoisted on his own petard, the tweet war reveals a more important fact city leaders around the world have realized that they have the power to make real and meaningful day-to-day -day change, much more so than federal governments. Why? Because they're closer to the people and held to account by the people. Not by because I'm any glorious political person or anything like that, but because I like to attend public events, I've been in the same room as our own mayor five times this year. Well, once it was on a bicycle track, but never mind. I mean, he's accessible, right? You can talk to him. They rub shoulders with their electors every day, and their interactions are more direct. This is one reason why city leaders are talking with each other and bypassing federal governments in the process. And Hidalgo, who the Paris mayor, who's also the current chair of the C40 group, once chaired by David Miller, said that urban diplomacy is needed because cities are on the front line of global events. Cities need nation states 
but we can also be active on the international level, she said. Cities are on the front line of globalization where we see all the effects from refugees to climate change. We don't say we are a counterpower to national governments, but we can still be a vocal power. Well, Professor Parag Khanna, who compares the ancient and modern city-states, has coined the term diplomacy. By this, he means both the ways that cities reach out to each other and form ties and agreements and share policy initiatives on common causes, but it also refers to how cities have to negotiate their way to meaningful power with their nations. He says the key issue is how much autonomy a city will have to pursue its own agenda. Also, their capacity to get and spend the money they need to do what they have to do. He says the action on climate change in cities is global. More than 50% of the world's population live in cities. The demographic concentration and the economic resources have changed the balance of power. Countries of even one or 200 million people with a megacity like Manila or Jakarta, their fate depends on what happens in that one city. The progress in that city often depends on the mayor. Sustainable urbanization is probably the most single global priority in the 21st century. Mayors are the ones on the front line. Mayors just know better than anyone else how to run the ancient political unit that is the city. And Kana's comments are supported by the former mayor, uh, Toronto mayor, David Miller, who said the job of being a mayor is an activist one. People expect you to produce results. They don't expect you to just say the right thing. They expect to see, see things really happen, whether it's building mass transit or changing the electricity grid. They have that expectation. So mayors are impatient and action-oriented. I do see the rise of cities, he said. We see the C40 being far more influential on climate change and issues like inequality. And I think as you see national boundaries becoming less and less relevant because of globalization and trade agreements, you're going to see cities become more and more relevant. Well, here in Edmonton, we've seen a shift through the last two incumbents in the mayor's office to a focus on what they define as a more livable city, a more global city, and definitely a more activist city. Now, not everybody's liked the change, and that's fine. As James Luther Adams wrote, voluntary associations only work if there is intentional inclusion of dissent. And so it comes back down to us. The real questions for each of us on October 16th are what kind of a city do you want? What kind of a school board do you want? Maybe a second question is, do you want this city to become a player in this new age of rising cities? There are a whole range of candidates out there, and their platforms are available to you. But maybe the most important question of all is this. Will you participate in this most fundamental, most grassroots exercise in democracy? Will you have your say? Or will you leave it to others and just hope for the best? It's not just the vote. It's the engagement with the issues that makes democracy work. The vote is just the end product of your deliberations. Our principles affirm and promote the use of the democratic process in our church and in society at large. That means we are called to exercise our right and our privilege when we are asked to set a future course for our city. It's not just a civic duty. For Unitarians, it is a religious one as well. Amen.